Hello again, welcome back. Today we are discussing The Trial 2007. The Trial 2007, or the trial that took place in 2007, was the reversal of custody trial. Now in 2003, I had gone to court and basically got my ass handed to me and took the kids away and for the next four years um, Stacy just basically played games with me and got away with it. It was, nothing was enforced. She would, um, deny visitation. She would deny phone contact. Uh, she would hide the kids out in Seneca, which is a small town in Kansas. She had a boyfriend that lived up there and she'd take them up there. I wouldn't see them for weeks, sometimes a uh, months at a time. Couldn't get a hold of them on the phone. And none of this was being enforced. I would complain to the case manager. I would ask for a retrial. I would ask for an opportunity to go back to court so that I could uh, voice my grievances. I don't know where she is. I can't get hold to her. I haven't spoken to the kids. I missed my weekend. I missed this. I missed that. And I was essentially ignored. And the case manager at this time was David Clausen Wilson. David Clausen Wilson was the second case manager who was put in charge after the original trial. The original case manager made the decisions for the trial, but then bugged out. David Clausen Wilson was put in charge. He took over and he essentially ignored me for the entire four years. Um, even though I would provide him with a lot, a lot of detailed information, photographs. I have photographs of the children in like, when I would get them for visitation, they would be raggedy, covered with insect bites. Uh, it, take a look at this really quick. That was a photograph of Warren, and those are flea bites. He had, he always had flea bites all over him. Both of them did. They uh, flea bites. There were mice in the house. There was feces in the house from from her dogs. The house was uh, cluttered and messy and very often they did not have running water or gas. There was no hot water. They were filling the bathtub with hot water from the stove. Sometimes there was no water. The water would be off. Um, and I would report this and report this and report this, what the kids are telling me. And I was ignored every time. The reports were constantly ignored. Yeah, reports are being made by the kids. Um, Warren would say things at school or things would happen at school, for example. Um, one occasion that comes to mind is he, he was so dry. Keep in mind, there's no running water. He was so dry and so soiled that the skin on his hands were beginning to crack and they were painful and bleeding. And the, the school nurse calls me and I'm out of town. And the school nurse calls me and wants to know if I can come and pick him up because she can't get a hold of the mother. And he's in terrible pain and his, his knuckles are bleeding. And I'm like, why are you calling me to come and pick him up? You're a mandated reporter. And first of all, I'm out of town anyway. It's going to take me like four hours to get there. He'll be out of school by then. Do your job. You get reports like this all the time. You guys are always calling me to come and get him. And then... I have to legally, I'm required to turn him straight over to his mother. There's nothing I can do. Do your job. Do you think she called it in? No. No, 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 she did not. They never call that stuff in. The school is just as responsible as everyone else for aiding and abetting the abuse and neglect of those two children. Moving on. Toby. Toby was at the point where he was being defiant. The two of them were getting into physical confrontations. There's an example of um, police coming out to the house. The police have been out to the house a few times. The neighbors would call it in. But at, on this particular occasion, he had been, for punishment, required to dig a hole in the backyard. And he was out there all day. It's summer. He's out there all day long into the evening. Had not eaten, could not eat until after the hole was dug, which is illegal. 
by the way, you can't uh, deny a child a meal in the United States anywhere. It's against the law. They don't have to eat it, but you cannot deny them a meal as a form of punishment. So he's out there digging holes in this yard. He comes in. He's it's he hasn't eaten all day. She gives him a bowl of oatmeal. It's not there's no sugar, and this is you know out of the can raw oats that you cook. No sugar, and he wants sugar, and she tells him he doesn't deserve sugar. So he decides he's going to get it on his own, and this results in a fist fight between the two of them. They're at it. Neighbors call the police again, and the police come and break it up and leave. They don't make a report. They, they, they don't rectify the situation. They just um, do the little domestic separation thing and go on again. So during this time period, Toby is also prone to, like I said, running away. And he had turned up at my house. And this is a hard thing to deal with when Toby would run away because I can't keep him. If I keep him, I am harboring and kidnapping. I've been warned about that. I, I talked to my attorney and I would call it in whenever he would show up and the police would make it very clear that if I kept him, I would be arrested unless they couldn't get a hold of the mother. So they'd call mom and she'd say, bring him back. They'd bring him back. If they couldn't get a hold of her, he would stay until further notice. So one of these days when he runs away, mom can't be contacted. So he stays with me and we got to talking because I was concerned about all of the different agencies that were involved in, in their family life and wondering why the hell nothing was being done. Aside from the school, which was obvious, the schools both had concerns but did nothing. You had TFI, which is the Farm Incorporated, which is in a social worker, child uh, support service that is outsourced by the city of Topeka, Shawnee County. You had Family Services and Guidance Center, which is another outsource, mostly medical. They do a lot of medical there, um, psychological prescriptions, that kind of medical. And he was seeing two people from there. One was a worker who came out to the house and visited with him once or twice a week. And one was a therapist, a clinical therapist that he had to go and visit once or twice a week. And then of course there's the case manager from the court. And there was apparently also an SRS worker, which is social and rehabilitation services, child welfare. And I'm like, all these people are in your business and they don't see the problem. Nothing is being accomplished. What's the number one problem for you? And the number one problem for him was that he was being badgered by some of these people, particularly from TFI and from uh, Family Services and Guidance Center, about keeping the house clean. He doesn't do his chores. He doesn't listen. He doesn't cooperate. His mother tells him this stuff. They believe it without investigating it. And then all he has to listen to every in every one of these therapy sessions is, Toby, why don't you pull your own weight? Toby, why won't you do your chores? Toby, why don't you listen? Toby, how come you don't cooperate? Toby, how come you're starting to run away? And he says that he cannot articulate the point, exactly what is wrong. So, okay, Toby, what's wrong? What, what, is, what do you think is wrong? I can't clean the house. It's impossible. The place is piled waist deep. It can't be done. What the hell do they want me to do? And he's crying and I'm like, okay, how about this? Your mom's out of town. Can you get into the house? And he says, sure, I can, I can get in through my bedroom window. The lock's broken. Toby, if I drive you over there, Keep in mind, I can't go in, but if I drive you over there and I give you my digital camera, can you take pictures of it? And then I will make sure all these people get a copy of those photos so that 
you can demonstrate to them your living environment. And he said, sure, I'll do it. So that night we drove over there. I gave him a camera. He went in through the window. He took a picture in every room, came back. And we went back home and I took the camera and I made a copy. I put the, you know, digital camera, I put it in the computer and I put it on discs. And the next morning I brought those discs all over town. And actually I'm going to show you those photographs. You saw some of them in the documentary, uh, from middle class to no class in America. I'm going to go ahead and run those photographs through here right now really quick. Absolutely disgusting, as you can see from the photos. Uh, feces, rat dropping, mouse droppings, um, just clutter, mess. It's impossible. There's no way that uh, a child or a teenager can feasibly clean that up, especially when they've been in that environment for a long time and they've gotten comfortable with it. You're comfortable with that environment. You're not going to... Um, you're not going to... Be too concerned with it. That's like if you ever watch hoarders and they're just, oh, you know, I, I guess it's a mess. Up. It's messy, and you know, oh, I don't know what I would do. They've they've got complacent. It's not a big deal to them anymore. And that's even where Toby was at, breaking him out of that hoarding um, mentality. He never really broke out of it. Warren was broken out of it eventually, but Toby, no. But anyways, I made copies of those discs and I brought them all over town. I went to TFI, I went to Family Services and Guidance Center, I went to the courthouse, I went to the SRS office, I went everywhere that I could think of to go, brought the disc, asked to speak to the worker, can I talk to this person, can I talk to that person, it was denied everywhere. Every place would not speak to me. They're not available, they can't talk to you right now, whatever, they blew me off. So I left the disc for them. Now. The social worker from Family Services and Guidance Center, the one who picks Toby up for visits, about a week later, calls me out of the blue. And she says, are you Toby's father? And I'm like, well, yes. And she was like, you live in town? And I'm like, yes, I do. And she said, if I told you that I needed you to take Toby, would you do it? And I said, yeah, I'll do it. What's wrong? Is he all right? And she goes, oh my God, I am so sorry. Yeah, it was absolutely a WTF moment. Basically, what she expressed to me at that time was, Stacy had told her that she didn't know where I lived, where I worked, and that I was completely out of contact. 
Basically, I didn't exist. So, but Toby said that I did and that he knew where I was and how to contact me. But she didn't listen to Toby. She did not listen to her client. She listened to the client's mother. Did never investigated it. Never investigated it. And so I didn't exist as far as they were concerned. Any of these agencies. Which, if they were collaborating with each other like they claimed they were, like they were supposed to, they would have been in contact with David Claus and Wilson anyways. And David Claus and Wilson heard from me all the time because I was constantly making complaints to the court about police involvement, about Toby running away, and about phone calls from the school, and about not having my visitation and contact. So anyway, she didn't know I existed. Now she does. Expressed to me concerns over the volatile situation between Toby and his mother wants to bring Toby to me in a pro in child protective uh, blanket basically and that he would stay with me until further notice and that she basically took what Toby had been telling her seriously because of the disc great bring him over she brought him that day now then the next day I get a call from David Clausen Wilson, the case manager, calling me for a change. And he says, I saw that disc. I, I got a call from the worker over at Family Services and she told me that asked me if I had that disc, because I told her I gave one to everybody, and told me that I had better take a look at it, and I took a look at it. Freudian slip right there. He admitted that he had that disc for over a week, basically, in that conversation, and had never bothered to look at it because I gave it to him. The social worker tells him to look at it. Suddenly, he wants to see it. But anyway, he looked at the disc, and he says, you know, that type of hoarding and the fact that apparently the water's not on. I mean, this, this is not only abuse and neglect, but the hoarding is a sign of mental illness. And I'm like, yeah, I've been telling you that for four years, uh, David. And he says, I think, uh, I think that we need to go back to court. So finally, I'm going to get a shot to go back to court. All right, so we arrive in court. At this time, um, Toby has been living with me for two solid months. Okay? Two solid months, uninterrupted. Mom has made no attempt to contact him. Visitation has been sketchy with Warren still, so we get to court, and the judge is furious, because basically all these agencies had to sit there on, beha um, on behalf of and through David Klaus and Wilson and admit, because the judge wanted to know how this went on for so long. It's been four years since the previous trial. These photos are severe. The condition of these children is atrocious. What the hell happened? David Klaus and Wilson, the worker from the farm, the social workers from uh, Family Services and Guidance Center, and from SRS, basically had to admit that none of them had ever been out to the house. They'd never been there, and they had never conducted an investigation, and had never taken anything I had to say seriously. It was never investigated, ever. Coming to the house consisted of going to the door. So they never went in to see the physical condition of the house. They never went in to see whether or not the utilities were working. They never interviewed the children without the mother being present with the exception of the worker who would pick Toby up, um, who is the first one to contact me when she got that disc. Uh, but even she just picked Toby up at the door and still followed the example that was left to her by the psychiatric evaluations that were being done in the Family Services and Guidance Center building. Judge was pissed off, and that was... Uh, Judge Judy Schmidt, I believe. What do you mean nobody's been in her house? She uh, still would not allow the children to speak 
This is a problem I see in family court all the time. It's kind of hard to find out the perspective of the children without actually talking to the children. And Toby at this point is 17, and she still will not hear him. I, I, don't, I will not listen to uh, children in my court. You're in family court. Deciding child custody. You won't hear the children. And one of them is 17 years old. This pisses me off. And this is the second time I have been through that in family court. Oh, we don't listen to kids. We just uh, make decisions for them. But anyway, she won't listen to Toby. However, she emancipates Toby. Toby is scot-free. Toby can do whatever he wants. Basically said that from this point forward, Toby, all contact is entirely at your discretion. You do not have to see your mother, talk to her on the phone, receive a letter from her, receive a gift from her. You do not have to have any form of communication whatsoever unless you request it first. And Stacy was asked what she thought of that, and she said she didn't care. And Toby cried. I mean, she just sat up there. Your mother sat in court and just said, "Whatever he wants, I really, don't, I don't really not worried about it. I don't care." And then he left the courtroom, and David Clausen went out after him. And I found out later on that David Clausen Wilson went after Toby to try to convince him to still maintain contact with his mother because it's the only mother you have. The same shit they used to tell me about my mother. Yeah, I don't know why everybody thinks that, you know, there's more than just maternity to being a mother. If they're not being a mother to you, they're not your mother. I don't care where you came out of. But then there's a flip-flop. Warren, the younger boy who's nine, gets guideline visitation. And I'm like, wait a minute, you just emancipated this one. Told him, oh, you don't have to see your mother at all. Uh, you don't have to suffer anymore and sat there and saw a mother disown her child in court and then gives the younger one visitation so I've got to deal with that for a little while anyways because that unfolded rather quickly by 2009 well about a year and a half a year and a half worth of visitation and I talked about that a little bit last week but we can talk about that again a little bit more actually I think next week's segment will discuss how that ended. But that's essentially uh, how the trial in 2007 went and how it came about. It was too long in coming. And it's also the reason why in my Q&A session I had talked about the fact that there remains the possibility for a blanket lawsuit against uh, capital city of Topeka, Kansas and Shawnee County. Because you have SRS, the Topeka Public Schools, um, Family Services and Guidance Center, the Farm Incorporated, and Court Services all failed those children. Not only did they fail them, but their neglect of their own duties aided and abetted a woman to abuse and neglect these two kids. The only reason, and there's no statute of limitations on abuse. The only reason that I don't pursue it is because I can't afford it. I can't afford an attorney to slam into the capital city of a state and drag all those agencies into it to sue them. It's just not in the budget. It'll probably never be in my budget. Well, obviously, first and foremost, after whatever has to go to the attorney and whatever has to go to taxes and fees and court fees and whatever else after all the money that must be paid has been removed any anything that is left over if there's anything left over would have to go to the benefit of the children it's only fair toby and warren that's they're the ones that uh, suffered the most under all of this so they are the ones who should benefit the most and in closing, uh, as we fade out here, I'm going to show you a picture of the, of the two boys before the trial so that you can, you can gauge the condition for yourself and you take a look at them. They were malnourished and filthy 
and covered with insect bites. And it's amazing that these agencies refuse to acknowledge or recognize this. In particular, um, keep in mind that Toby is 17 and Warren is nine years old. And Toby looks like he was in a concentration camp and Warren looks like he's five. As a matter of fact, at nine years old, he was wearing a 5T. That's what size clothing he was wearing. His growth was stunted by, uh, by malnutrition. And to this day, he still maintains a relatively small stature.